All right, everybody. So we've now made it through the first quarter of this semester, and we've had our first exam. And for that, we covered the classical through the medieval period. And so we can put that to rest for a while, though we'll be mentioning it throughout the next part because people kept looking back. This was their most recent history, just like we always look at our most recent history. And so today, um, if you took the quiz ready for this one, you know the period we're jumping into is the Renaissance. The movement was that, but the Renaissance is the time period. Now, the medieval period heading into the Renaissance, there's an overlap. You know, one period doesn't come to an end and the next one begins any more than the classical age just hit a point and said, we're done, medieval take over. And so, in the beginning of the Renaissance, we're still doing mystery plays, we're still performing them in cycles, morality plays are still being created. There are some people who overlap both. You know, they're beginning in the late, late Middle Ages and they're at the very cusp of the Renaissance. But I would argue that where we are today has a lot to do with the Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance was an explosion in Europe. At the moment the Renaissance occurs, everything before basically gets you know, stepped on, wiped out, and we leave it behind in the Middle Ages. And that's a simplification. Um, but it is where we're headed with this. It's during the Renaissance we have our big names, Michelangelo, Raphael, the rest of the turtles. They start coming out at this time. Shakespeare makes his emergence, Kid Marlowe. You know, it's everything rolling at this phase. So before we get underway, raise the arm with the band. Yeah, I know, I always want to yell, I am Spartacus when I see it. All right, and over the nose, over the mouth. Didn't mean to hit you while you were drinking to say that. <laughs> Just those awful moments. And so the word renaissance means rebirth. What was it a rebirth of? What? Classical culture? Well, you're in the right area. This re... what? Well, neoclassism is what it's going to become. It is a rebirth of classical ideas, which classical culture is going to play a part of, but the rebirth is of classical ideas. We have our Greeks, we have our Romans, we hit the Middle Ages. Well, the Middle Ages is the rise of Christianity. What did Christianity think of the Romans? I see people shaking their heads, <laughs> but do I have an answer? Was life great under the Romans? You know, at the fall of Rome, Christianity wasn't there to hug them and help them up. You know, the fall of Rome, Christianity takes over and it becomes the Holy Roman Empire. Theater gets banned. But the thing is, when Christianity rises, it's not satisfied with that. They start trying to destroy every pagan idea that existed before. You know, they're tearing down temples to Jupiter, they're burning stuff that belongs to Mercury. You know, they go and wipe out tons of manuscripts. One of the reasons we have so few plays left, not only natural disasters, but man-made disasters. And so we wipe out all the, these items that we had in the classical age. You know, remember, we had plumbing with the Romans. And then the Middle Ages hit, and we're back to going behind a tree. You know, we had innovations in medicine. The Greeks figured out aspirin. So over 2,000 years ago, we had aspirin. Then the medieval period hit, and the guy was like, if you boil this willow bark, it'll make your headache go away. And people yelled, witch, and burned him. And so we stopped using all this stuff we had created in the classical age that was progress. Literacy rates fell through the floor, you know, because the medieval period came in and it was no longer about society, it was about preparing for the next world. Well, the Renaissance comes along and there's this refocus on this world. 
and the Renaissance is more secular. This doesn't wipe out everything that was going on in the Middle Ages. Please remember that. There's still going to be inquisitions. There's still going to be you know, some continuing religious battles, just as there are religious battles today. But the Renaissance is going to be a huge step forward. And in that step forward, they look back and somebody says, you know this plumbing idea? That was a pretty good idea. I don't know why we got rid of this. And we start trying to imitate and recreate the ideas that occurred at that time period. That's where we get that term neoclassic. Neoclassic simply translates to the new classic. Neoclassic is the new classic. And the reason is during the Renaissance, we attempt to start creating new works based on the old models. You know, we look at what they did in the classical age and say, okay, this is the good way to do it. Let's stop doing it, you know, where it has to come from the Bible. Let's stop doing it where it has to come from this and this and this in the most recent religious text. Let's start making this stuff. Now, the Renaissance, to set it up, please understand, it just isn't an idea that somebody wakes up with and says, hey, let's do this. A lot of things lead us to this. One thing very big that happened, and you all know the date, 1492. You know, everybody knows that nursery rhyme that just drives you nuts with the melody. But here's the thing, the world doubled in size. Up until Columbus, this was it. We had Africa, we had Europe, and we could push off into Asia. You know, 1492, all of a sudden, we begin trade in North America and South America. So the world doubles in size. And with it, you know, we start bringing in stuff that had never existed in Europe before or in any European culture. The Romans had pizza, but they had never had a pizza with tomato sauce until the Renaissance. Tomatoes are a new world fruit. And so, literally, it changes everything that we're doing. Once we start discovering what was over here, you know, tobacco is new world. Nobody in this area had ever smoked tobacco until we hit 1492. You know, and, you know, I'd say it's probably the biggest cash crop that ever existed. You know, and plantations all up and down the coastlines were founded based on this. And so, this changed everything. What is it? The printing press. Once Gutenberg created his printing press, I would argue that's when the church got out of producing theater. At that moment, producing theater is no longer vital because they're going into publishing. What was the first book Gutenberg published? The Bible. Now, let me tell you right now, a Gutenberg Bible, that's probably two and a half feet by uh, a foot and a half, and it weighs a whole lot. Uh, but the Gutenberg Bible, there's only about a hundred of them still in existence today. They're incredibly valuable, as you can imagine. But once we start with movable type, please understand, before this, if you owned a book, it was handwritten. Monasteries were full of monks, and all they did every day was sit down and start copying books. And so books were rare, they were expensive, you did not have a large collection of them. Now, all of a sudden, we could start producing books in mass scale. And as a result, literacy begins to rise also during the Renaissance. We start to believe, you know, they start looking at the school of Athens, they see, you know, well, Socrates was Plato's teacher, and you know, Plato was Aristotle's teacher. We've got to set up education also. You know, we need some form of education going around to make this work. And so you know, the press changes us. Big day. Anybody know it? What was the start of? The Protestant Reformation. What is a Protestant? Uh, what? A Christian that's not Catholic. 
up until this point in history, this whole time in the medieval period, whenever I said the church, the Holy Mother Church, Christianity, I was talking about one religion, and that religion was Catholicism. They were the only game in town. They are what emerged after the fall of Rome. In fact, the Vatican, the head of the Catholic Church, you can find today in Rome. You know, their base is just set up where the base of the previous regime was. Well, Martin Luther comes along, a German monk who is, a, you know, in the Catholic Church, and he starts having problems with some of the things the church does. And he's going to take a lot of this personally, and he's going to start working on it, and he's going to become one of the most controversial figures in the church at that time. But the Protestant Reformation is the first Christian branch to break off from the Catholic Church. You know, Pentecostal, Lutheran, Methodist, Baptist, all of those are classified as Protestant. So any Christian religion outside of the Episcopalian, the Church of England, those are all Protestant faiths. There's going to be a lot of wars fought over this. But Martin Luther's break from the church, you know, he had a laundry list, you know, and he tacked them up on a door basically saying, you know, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. One of the things he had the biggest problem with was uh, the sale of indulgences. Anybody have any clue what I'm talking about? Buy your way to heaven. Buy you know, during the Middle Ages, to get people to go off to the Crusades, they would tell them, listen, you know, no matter what bad things you did in life, if you, you know, take up the sword, head off to the Middle East and fight, if you die, you'll go to heaven no matter what. And a lot of people were like, well, I've done a lot of bad things, nothing to lose. And when the church started straining for money, they would go around and say, listen, you know, if you're willing to buy this much from us, or if you're willing to purchase this, they would sell you a little certificate, and then when you died, you could show it to St. Peter, and they'd let you into heaven no matter what. But to make it better for you, you know, let's say you had a really bad father, and they're dead, and you know, well, all the things he did, he's definitely not in heaven. Well, you could go to the church and buy an indulgence for him, and they would give you a piece of paper that basically said, you know, we got your dad out of hell, and now he can be in heaven, so you'll see him again. And they made a fortune doing this. And... Martin Luther just had enough of it. They actually had a guy, uh, you know, Teasel, who used to travel all over Europe for the church, just basically a big fundraiser where people were just purchasing tons of indulgences from one side to the other. And Luther, of course, jumps up and says, you can't buy your way into heaven, and the church has a heart attack. This is how they make a fortune, you know, every couple of years. And so he is going to break off from the church, and he's going to be classified as a heretic, Two words you're going to hear a lot, infidel and heretic. When they were fighting in the Crusades, they were fighting the infidel. But that's okay because, you know, those already in the Middle East were fighting the infidel in return. Infidel simply means somebody who is outside of the dominant religion or the religion of that area. And so infidels to the church were... Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, in the case of the Crusades. A heretic is a person who is born into the church and then rejects it. Infidels, you can put to the side. Heretics, well, that was a huge crime. And so a lot of people wanted to get a hold of Martin Luther, and if they had, it would have been bad for him. But Luther, over in Germany, got the protection of a lot of nobles, and he sits down and actually made a copy of the Bible for the first time, not in Latin. He translates the Bible into German, where anybody who can read German can now pick it up and make their own decision. And so for the first time, the church isn't telling people, well, it says this. People can pick it up and look at it for themselves and say, well, no, I don't think that means that. This was all revolutionary for its time, but a discovery of a new world, a Protestant Reformation, the printing press, 
all these things are exploding that take us into the Renaissance. You know, that's really the big point to it is, you know, we arrive at it. Now this is Leo X. Now Leo X was one of those popes who made a fortune selling indulgences. But the thing about Leo X is Leo X became pope through family connections because his family was the most powerful family at the start of the Renaissance. And that family was the Medici or the Medici. Uh, M E D I C I, Medici. So the Medici, as I said, were the most powerful family at the beginning of the Renaissance. Now, do note, the Renaissance begins in Italy. Now, there's a lot of reasons behind this. Italy was the seat of the church. I Italy was the wealthiest country in all of Europe, so it had the money to spend for it. You know, Italy just had a lot of things going for it. The Medici, though, were people who took full advantage of all the things that Italy had and then exploded with it. The Medici became wealthy by figuring out a way against church, around church law, against uh, usury. Any guesses on what usury is? It was considered a great sin at the time. Close. Somebody in here needs five bucks. I tell them, okay, fine. I give them five bucks. I tell them I need the money back tomorrow but I want five dollars and a quarter, and I want a quarter for every day it's late. What am I doing? Interest. It was considered unchristian to charge interest. You could not loan out money for profit. You know, and so the church banned it. The only, you know, if you needed money to start a business or something, you would have to go to infidels. You could not borrow from a Christian. And so you would have to find an infidel to loan you money because other faiths don't have the same issue. And so what the Medici did was they basically became an ATM. When you go to an ATM, you put in your card and you say, well, I need $20. And they say, fine. But then it tells you, but it's going to cost you this. They started charging fees, not interest. And their logic behind it that had the church say, okay, well, I guess that's all right. If I'm going off to the Crusades and I've got a thousand ducats, I can go to the Medici and give them a thousand ducats and they'll give me a piece of paper that says, you know, we owe this guy a thousand ducats. I get on a boat in Italy. I sail off to Israel. I get there. I go to the Medici bank there. I show them this sheet of paper and they give me like 980 ducats. And so they've moved the money for me for a fee. You know, it's no interest, nothing tied into it like that. They became incredibly wealthy. You know, Florence became like the center of culture for a long time over in uh, Italy. To give you an idea of the power of this family, their tutor for their children was Galileo, uh, and most of their portraits were done by Michelangelo, who was basically their artist in residence. And so they constantly were like, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? But they are one of the leading reasons that Italy has this wealth. You know, and that gives us the Renaissance starting there because they have the leisure to pull it off. So when the Renaissance really gets rolling is when we start also discovering some of these texts that existed before the rise of Christianity. In monasteries, over in you know, small places in Ireland, over in the East, and Constantinople, over in modern-day uh, Turkey, uh, they still had copies of the poetics, the art of poetry, Oedipus Rex. And so these things start being collected and brought back to Rome, and people start looking at them and wondering, well, why have we been doing this when this stuff existed? And this is where the rebirth really gets underway because everything else is just showing how the money starts coming in, how the literacy rates start rising, and now it's time for the cultural shift. 
and the cultural shift that we have hit right here under the neoclassical rules that they start establishing. They start looking at Horace's work, the art of poetry. Remember, Horace's art of poetry, he says stuff like, you know, it's got to be five acts. It's got to have the good guy victorious and the bad guy punished. It's got to have this. It's got to have this. So they start seeing this as rules. You know, in order to create drama, you must do this. You must do this. So then they discover Aristotle. And Aristotle, remember, Aristotle never sat there and said, you must do this. Aristotle sat there and wrote, I've seen a lot of plays. This worked. This didn't work. You know, at no time is he sitting there saying, you know, if we don't do this, everything will fall apart. Well, they take Aristotle's writings and they say, well, here are more rules that predate Horace's rules. And so we're going to go with them also. And so from that, we get the neoclassical rules. And so we look down this, you know, tragedy had to be stories about the nobility, the upper class. Why? Because tragedy, somebody falls. And a guy working in a field who loses everything didn't have much to lose. A person who has a kingdom, Oedipus Rex, Antigone, all the plays that we've talked about, Agamemnon, when they lose everything, they had a lot to lose. And so there's tragedy. Comedy is about the middle and lower classes. All plays have to contain five acts. Why? Because Horace said, hey, Seneca did it like this. Everybody should do it like this. And so everything had to come out. A uh, play must uphold the concept of poetic justice. Poetic justice. When I uh, first moved to Alabama in my very first year here, they had an inc uh, incident in Atlanta. Guy went into a hotel and is holding it up. And got clerk behind the desk gives him all the money. And then he still shoots the clerk. And they have it all on video. But when he pulls the trigger, both he and the clerk fall to the ground. And what had happened was a bullet was stuck in the barrel. So he pulls the trigger. The gun explodes in his hand. Now, the bullet that was stuck in the barrel, it strikes the clerk. You know, not a good story. Clerk, you know, hit in the gut. You know, he did make it. But the guy who had the gun when he pulled the trigger, the bullet that struck the back exploded and hit him in the head and killed him right there. That is what they would call poetic justice. You know, no matter what was happening, in the end, somehow, the person who was doing wrong, something was going to happen to him. And then this bottom one, misinterpreted Aristotle's three unities. Now, I actually had that on the quiz for you because the three unities are a fairly big deal. They're going to dominate a lot of what we look at. So our three unities, time, place, and action. Our three unities are time, place, and action. One of the big stress points in neoclassical drama, when they took a look at what was occurring uh, for the Greeks, and the Greek plays were fairly short, is that verisimilitude becomes a big idea. Don't worry about writing it out. It simply means lifelike, believable, realistic. And so you can have realistic, like, you know, uh, Shakespeare's A Winter's Tale is a play that takes place over a 25-year period. That can't happen in a neoclassical world. 25 years can't pass on stage. We watch movies all the time. A person's a child, and all of a sudden, by the end of the movie, they're an adult. You know, we accept that. You can do that in film. And some stage shows do it, but not, not in the neoclassical world. It had to be presented as close as possible to the way the world was. So in the unity of time, all plays, their stories, had to be resolved within one rotation of the sun. And so 24 hours. You know, play started in the morning. Usually it'll be done that evening. A lot of plays were written, so they were actually run in real time. So if the play took an hour and a half to perform, the story was usually done in an hour and a half. You know, there wasn't any, you know, a whole bunch of jumping around in time. It just ran in the actual time that it takes to tell the story. But unity of time, 24 hours. Unity of place. A play that starts in London can't end in Paris. Especially at this time period, you're not going to make that journey. 
Also, a play that in, uh, starts in the north side of London can't end in the south side of London because it's impossible to make that journey at this time period. And so as a result, plays that are being created in the neoclassical area generally take place in one area. If you do have two areas that are being performed in, it's generally like, here's my front porch and here's my living room. But you're not going to be able to move around. So wherever you base your play, when that, you know, when that show starts, that's where that show is going to end. You know, unity of place, you cannot move around. And then finally, and the most complicated, was the unity of action. You know, the unity of action basically dictated, you know, listen, keep it to one plot. You know, there's one story we're going to tell. And also, the unity of action basically called for that verisimilitude. Whatever appears on stage, you have to be able to accomplish on stage. You can't have two armies face off on stage. Why? Because you can't fit two armies on a stage. So don't write it. You know, if it's an argument, two people have to settle something, yeah, you can pull that off on stage. But you can't start dragging catapults on stage to, st you know, have a siege. And so if you can't pull it off realistically, don't put it in. The unity of action has to be believable. They tie themselves to this in a neoclassical world. You know, Aristotle talked about it, so it had to be right. Remember, Aristotle never said, this is what you have to do. But during the neoclassical period, everybody looks at his stuff and says, well, he said it, let's go with it. He and Horace really rule the day with a lot of this stuff. So, big jump that occurs in the Renaissance is the world of visual art. And I talked before, this is where we get, you know, Raphael, Michelangelo, da Vinci, all of them start rolling out at this time. This was the medieval period. And this is the Renaissance. Same theme, incredibly different. And the big jump in this is depth, the illusion of depth and proportion. In the medieval period, if you were trying to show that you know, people were you know, weaker or lower status, you made them small. You know, and the most important stuff was large. You know, we didn't have proportion really working for us, but then we get to the Renaissance and bam. And also, during the Renaissance, we start to have secular art emerge. Secular is a fancy word for, and I've said it before, non-religious. We start to move away from, you know, remember medieval period, everything is about preparing for the next world. You know, we hit the Renaissance and all of a sudden, you know, the birth of Venus. We start looking at what these pagan ideas had and we start creating paintings around it. And so everything takes a big jump. The art becomes possible because of perspective. Perspective is the visual art form that gives depth to two-dimensional drawings. It was in the late Middle Ages that somebody actually came up with this, but it doesn't really become widely known and appreciated till you know, really into the Renaissance. Guy walked into a church, there was a flat wall, you know, he finished painting, the monk said it looked as if he had created another room in the church. Everybody looked at it like they could go into it. This is by Raphael, you know, it's actually him here in his uh, self-portrait, Da Vinci, Michelangelo. But the depth and everything we see in this is all done through perspective. You know, all these lines taking us, it's a single point perspective that creates this. Once again, all the windows and everything in order to create that depth. And that's what gives us the scenery we even use today. The reason the proscenium stage explodes and is being used in the Renaissance is because of visual art. For the first time we're on stage, we can now put something behind you that makes it look like you're in a forest. We can now put something behind you that makes it look like you're in a large mansion. You know, we don't have to dress things up. Props were almost never used on stage, folks. And so if you were in a kitchen, it was because there was a kitchen painted behind you. You know, nobody actually went through the problems of actually building any of this. 
this stuff explodes. You know, like the stage for this, you know, is right here. Everything past that is just going to be drawn on there and painted. Same thing about here. This is what the proscenium gave us the advantage to do. Now, in the quiz you had, they really spend a lot of time on this. And it's because we came up with all of these rules for creating drama. But the most popular form of theater in Renaissance Italy didn't follow those rules. We said it had to have this, we said it has to have this, you know, you got to do this and this and this. And then everybody said, okay, and then they went to go see the Commedia dell'arte. So why is the Commedia, the most popular form of theater, not following any of the rules they created for the theater? Not a hypothetical question. What? It is funny, but you know, there were two genres that they re-embraced. You know, there was supposed to be tragedy and comedy, even though they only had Aristotle's writings on tragedy, and they said, well, you know, we'll put comedy in the same framework and let it go. When we take a look at this, dialogue and comedic interludes were improvised. The Italian improviso. Comedy, improvisation today. Neoclassicism was an intellectual movement. Sculpture, paintings, novels, theater, i.e. drama, the written works. Commedia dell'arte wasn't written. It was, you know, this is how this scenario is going to play out. This is how we're going to work it out. Let's go. And the actor was everything. They generated their material. They had no playwright sitting there. Yes, they would write down bits and say, OK, in case this happens, we do this. In case this happens, we do this. But they weren't writing plays. They weren't part of the drama. And because they weren't trying to create drama, i.e., this high intellectual stuff that everybody else was saying you have to be Aristotle for, they could get away with this stuff. You know, This was a big thing for them. The Commedia was built on stock characters. Now, what do I mean by stock characters? Starting to feel like a ride at Disney World, breaking down every few seconds. Stock character guys, they did talk about it. If I went to a theater in northern Italy and saw a Commedia show, this character would always be in it and would always be being played by a different actor no matter where I went, but it would have the same stylings. Each one of these characters reappears again and again and again no matter where you see the show, it's always going to have these sets of characters with actors playing those roles, attempting to do the same thing for that role every other actor is doing. There were three archetypes of characters in the Commedia. We had the servants, we had the masters, and we had the lovers. The masters were the upper class, the doctors, the lawyers, the bankers. The servants, of course, you know, were maids, were cooks. You know, were gophers, go for this, go for that. And then the lovers were always the children of the masters who wanted to marry each other, but the masters were saying, no, it's better if you marry this person because financially we can then make these deals. And the servants were the stars of the show because they were always helping the lovers actually be with who they actually wanted to be with. It's a very simple plot that's going to follow us all the way down to melodrama. Commedia dell'arte, the actors wore masks. And so when an actor came out on stage, you knew who the character was instantly by the mask they were wearing. So you knew instantly, OK, that's Pantalone, that's Brighella, that's Arlecchino. Instantly, no matter where you were in Italy and soon to be all of Europe, you know, when you saw that mask come on stage, you knew what that character was going to do. It fulfilled it. 
And so the most important of all these characters to emerge from the Commedia is Arlecchino. Arlecchino is the one that we still actually have today in our language. Uh, when we translated it to English, we ended up with Harlequin. So I talked about how it's stock characters. This is what comes from the Commedia, folks. The Commedia was always a comedy of hierarchy. And so at the top, you always had the father. And the father was always bumbling, trying to make something work, but always coming up with horrible ideas. And the wife at the Commedia was always trying to fix things. You know, he would set up this whole thing, oh, we're going to be rich because I'm going to do this, 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 and this. And then the wife has to step in and try and save the day and get the kids back with who they want. What we have in modern animation today is the reason people were going to see the Commedia of its day. Now, do note, the Commedia was obscene. It was outrageous at times. Um, if you remember your quiz from the other night, uh, the Lotsies, one of my favorites was um, Arlecchino's cure for a toothache was to rub uh, pepper and vinegar on his ass. And it's like, well, yeah, you would probably forget your toothache pretty quick with that. But this is the advice he would get from the doctor in the show. And so this is the derivative of what comes out of the Commedia. It was in many ways live action cartoon characters running around. They were very acrobatic. I mean, it was more like watching athletes out there perform. So Commedia troops were always traveling for the most part. You know, we move out of that gypsy wagon idea that we had in the medieval period where they're outlaws who have to travel all the time because if they stick around, they're going to get arrested to the Commedia dell'arte where they're traveling troops where that wagon they're pulling is actually a stage that opens up. They're going to do their show in the town and then pack up and head to the next town because you know you can't just live doing the same show in the same place all the time. And so you know Renaissance Italy becomes a highly progressive area. You know theater is thriving in places, art is thriving everywhere, you know the church is wealthy, you know most Italians are highly wealthy at this time. Please understand, while the Italians are beginning the Renaissance, a lot of other countries, nations at this time, are rebuilding. You know, France was on the edge of bankruptcy. Britain was on the, you know, the edge of bankruptcy at this time. Italy, the Renaissance beginning there, and all this is occurring there because it has the financial stability that the others do not. You know, that's what gives them the huge advantage. And as I said with Arlequino, this word that we have today in English, Harlequin, Harlequin is the character that is the derivative of the Arlecchino from Italy. So, neoclassicism becomes a very big deal. Italian culture begins to sweep all over Europe. Why? Because everybody goes on these pilgrimages to the Vatican. So they're in Rome and they see what's going on in Italy and then they go back to their home countries and they're like, oh, there was this and this and the theaters and, you know, it, it was, you know, it had curtains and it looked like you could see forever watching the stage. And so all these ideas start to spread throughout Europe. These ideas are going to move from Italy and start to push into the middle, western and northern parts of Europe. The country that embraces these ideas possibly more than any other is France. The French find neoclassicism amazing. And, you know, they see it and they can't figure out why anybody ever did anything other. And so the French not only embrace it, but the French eventually are going to make neoclassical rules into neoclassic, neoclassic laws. And one of the reasons they have to come up with this is this man here, Pierre Cornel. Now, Cornell was a playwright, and in fact, his playwright here, Le Cid, was one of the most popular plays in Renaissance France. The problem with this play, and if you did watch your crash course, you know, you know it was not exactly a big hit with the French intellects, is that nearly everything that had been set up in the neoclassical world, as far as you must do this, you must do this, and you must do this, he didn't do. You know, they went nuts over him because he basically broke everything they were trying to establish. And so in his play, it begins in the middle of Spain, and in this, you know, 24-hour cycle, he gets all the way to the south of Spain, 
fights the Moors in a great war, then travels back. Uh, at the beginning of the play, he gets into an argument with the, um, the father of the woman he loves, and he ends up killing the father, and now he doesn't know what to do. Do I commit suicide? Oh, my God. Oh, wait, I've got my job. I've got to go down and fight the Moors. Go, and then comes back, you know, confronts the woman, and in the end, she ends up marrying him. And the French came in and said, listen, you can't jump all over the place. This definitely didn't happen in one rotation of the sun. And no woman is ever going to marry the man who killed her father. And please understand, this show had crowds showing up. People loved it. It was a swashbuckling show. There was like a sword fight every few seconds in it. Everybody loved what was going on stage. It was a blockbuster. Yet they came in and said, no, this is not right. You can't do this. And so the French started what became known as the Académie Française. You can just put French Academy. The Académie Française exists today. Its job today is that it regulates the French language. We don't have anything like this in English. If we did, they'd go nuts trying to regulate the English language. We're just, you know, we, we create words all the time, new words enter our vocabulary. The Académie Française you know, words can't just enter the language. They have to approve them. And so if a word starts being used, sooner or later it gets to the Académie Française, and they're the ones who say, okay, you know, this is a French word. If you're trying to use an email in France, everybody knows when you're saying, I need email, but, you know, they don't say email. They say, et courriel. Why? Because email is an English word, and they're not letting it into the language, so they have their own translation for it. And so even though people will know what you're talking about, they'll go, Ecorel, yes, yes, that's what I need at this time. You know, they still exist today, they still operate, but their founding was based off of La Cid. And so this government body's created to take a look and decide, well, Here's this play that was written. Everybody seems to love it. What do you think about it? And they look it over and they basically uh, tell, you know, Pierre that, you know, we know you wrote something that people like, but we're sorry. You know, it just, it's too far out there. It breaks too many things that we've tried to establish. We can't let it go on. You know, Carnelli did not recover really from this. I don't think he wrote another play for like four years. He was so upset about, you know, everything they had put down. But, you know, he wrote one of those summer blockbusters and it basically got pulled out the theater right in the middle of its run. And so the French Academy becomes this body that whatever you create, they have to approve. You know, they're basically the Hayes Code for the French. And so the rules that they were uh, actually uh, enforcing, and remember these became laws, you know, drama has to have a moral lesson, no mixing of dramatic styles, must observe the unities, must divide into five acts. Basically everything the Italians were saying, if you don't do, you're not a good playwright. They said, if you don't do, we're not going to let your plays be seen. And so they just go a step further. The person they did believe was their great playwright was Jean Racine. Jean Racine. And his great play was Phaedra. I hate to say it this bluntly, but I, I, I can't get through it. It's one of those plays that, you know, I understand its his historical significance. I understand in the French language it's highly poetic. It's got all these things going for it. But at the end of the day, it just takes forever and it's a lot of talking. You know, and I think Crash Course does a really good job summing up this show, so I'm not going to go in detail except to say that, you know, Mom starts making passes at her stepson. Stepson, you know, gets really weirded out, goes to run and find dad. Accidents happen. He ends up dying. You know, father confronts, you know, uh, wife. Wife confesses to what happened and then kills herself. The end. Why were they jumping for joy with it? Well, it had poetic justice. In the end, she was punished. It was a tragedy. In the end, she dies. You know, it all happened in one room. It all happened within one, you know, rotation of the sun. Everything they were looking for, rule-wise, it fit. Was it as exciting as battling the Moors in the south of Spain and traveling all over and getting in duels? Mm, probably not. But this is what they kept looking at, saying, this is what we're trying to accomplish. This is drama. 
Now, both of those individuals pale compared to this guy, Moliere. Moliere in French is like saying Shakespeare in English. He's that big of a name. He's that important of a name in their theater. He is easily the greatest French playwright of the Renaissance, and in the canon of French works that exist today, he is still near the top, if not the top guy producing. The big difference between him and the previous two, Racine and Cornell, is that everything that Moliere wrote was a comedy. And the, probably the great difference between him and Cornell is that he kept adapting his work trying to get around the Académie Française. Because a lot of his stuff angered a lot of people. He made fun of a lot of people. He was like Aristophanes calling people out. And every time they would object and say, well, this play has to be you know, shut down because you did this, he would go in and change that and then put it on again and they'd show up and say, no, well, now you're doing this and he'd go back and rework that trying to get it through. Now, Moliere was an actor. Please put that down. He wrote plays simply so the company he worked in had stuff to perform. He wasn't sitting there writing plays saying, oh, you know, 250 years from now, people are going to read this and think I was great. No, he wrote plays for the same reason Shakespeare wrote plays. It's how he made a living. And so he was the head of an acting troupe that for many years toured the provinces, i.e. outside of Paris, the surrounding areas. And then when they got to Paris, they had built up this repertoire over 10 years of working out there and were able to hit the ground running and start doing their stuff. And people loved them. I mean, they were a very big deal when they finally settled down in Paris. They were a troupe that just went out there working. His most vital work is Tartuffe. Tartuffe is the vital work of Moliere. Now, if you say Tartuffe in French, today the word also means hypocrite. And so if you say someone's a Tartuffe in French, you know, you're saying they're a hypocrite. Tartuffe is a pious religious man in appearance, when actually he's a con man. And the play is wonderful because he's convinced the father, just like in the Commedia dell'arte, just like in you know, Fred Flintstone, just like Homer Simpson, he's fooled the father in believing that he is the only person who can save the father's soul. He can get him to the other side okay. And so the father takes him into the house and basically does everything Tartuffe tells him. And so Tartuffe will sit at the dinner table, tell the family they're gluttonous, you know, they have all this and they're poor in the street and everything else. And the family walks away from the table feeling bad and once they're all out the room, he drinks everyone's wine and starts eating off everyone's plates. You know, he's a man of appetites. You know, he starts chasing after the guy's daughter. He starts chasing after the guy's wife. You know, he is just the person who has no problem with anything. So, we hit the end of the play, and Oregon, the father, finds out, my God, I've been con. This man isn't a religious man at all. And as he discovers it, they call in the authorities, and Tartuffe produces paperwork showing that Oregon has signed everything over to him. And the police, you know, from that time, they take a look and they said, well, all this is correct. And Tartuffe orders the family out of the house and everybody's tossed out except for Tartuffe and that's the end of the show. And that's what got the show canceled the first time. Because what's the problem with it? No poetic justice. Man came in there, would pray one moment with everybody and then hurry up and take money out the drawer Guy was constantly, you know, cheating everyone on stage, lying to everyone on stage, and at the end of the show, he's the one with all the money, he's the one who owns the house, he's the one in power. The church flipped out over this play. And please understand, you know, when I say the church, it is referring back to the Holy Mother Church because France was highly Catholic at the time. Huguenots, which were French Protestants, were still struggling to get recognized during the Renaissance for a long time. Well, they flipped out because they were like, well, you know, you're making fun of the priesthood. You're making fun of religion. And he's like, no, I'm making fun of a con man who's using religion as a guise. And so they kept going back and forth. It took two years of rewrites 
for this play to finally get established where they weren't throwing it off. And the only reason that we have Tartuffe today that we know of is this guy. Louis XIV. Now, Louis XIV was a big fan of theater. He loved going to the theater. And when he saw Tartuffe, he was amazed by it. And the church complained about it, no, nobles complained about it. But he couldn't figure out why people were upset, and it's because Moliere knew his audience, and he knew how to get it through. And so, today, Tartuffe is known because it has what is considered by many people the greatest deus ex machina in theater history. Now, deus ex machina, we learned in the classical period, means the god machine. But we use it in modern literature for what? A false or contrived ending. An ending that just comes out of nowhere. And so, you know, Louis XIV's watching the play, and Tartuffe in the end produces the paperwork, shows the authorities, and all of a sudden, one of those authorities jumps up and says, No, I have been sent here by the king. And so he just goes on. We are fortunately, we have a king who sees into the hearts of men. We have a king who can do this. We have a king who can tell right from wrong. We have a king who has always known these things were going to happen. You know, our king, you know, has insights that have brought me here today. And so it's because of this king that we have that I can stop this. And so he shows up and they arrest Tartuffe and they give everything back to the family. And that's how the play ends. It just comes out of completely nowhere. Well, everybody else was still objecting, saying, well, you know, he's making fun of the church, he's making fun of this, he's making fun of this, but, you know, Louis sees this ending and is like, that's pretty good. You know, I see into the hearts of men, I know right from wrong, I have vision beyond normal men, you know, I don't see where there's a problem in this play. And so this is what saves the play. It took about two years of rewrites for him to finally give this sort of ending that he can get through it, but this is the play we have today. You know, Moliere was that guy who adapted. You know, he would change with the times. He was a highly controversial figure in his life as an actor and a playwright. Uh, the church and him had constant run-ins with each other. He actually died after a performance of The Imaginary Invalid. Throughout the performance, he was coughing, he was doing really bad. After the performance was over with, you know, he finally passed away. The church refused to bury him on consecrated soil. You know, they did not want him buried under the guise of the church. They said he was an awful person, an actor, and all this other stuff. Louis stepped in and got him buried, but it was a very controversial thing for its time period. And so, da -da. all right, that's going to jump us too far ahead of where we should be. All right, folks, uh, I'm going to call the roll.